Good morning, y'all. Welcome to Car Talk. This is episode eight now, and wow, I'm I'm really tired. Not gonna lie, it's currently seven forty seven forty nine in the morning. Uh, my first class doesn't start till nine. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, I should really plan things out better before I start making a video because most of my videos are just kind of rambling. But hey, if you like that, that's cool. Cool on you, right? Um, so today is Thursday, right? The second to last day of the first week of my second semester of school. And so far, it's going really well. I like my classes. I don't have too many of them. And I'm excited because I think this semester will be a lot better than last semester. The high school honor band is tomorrow and I'll be helping out with that at 8 a.m. sharp and I've got a few friends who are in the honor band from high school and I'm kind of excited about it because it's cool it's fun I did honor band for two years and and yeah that was fun so I'm excited there's some really good food places here on campus that are super underrated if you ever get a chance to come to Dixie I mean, there's great stuff in the cafe, but you've got to try the sandwiches and shakes at Stax at the uh, Holland Centennial Commons because these these things are amazing. <clears throat> Sorry, like nothing, nothing beats these sandwiches and shakes. They are the best. We've also got a Pizza Hut, a Subway, a Chick Fil A, and a. Uh, a couple of other things, a burger joint and Asian place essentially, but I'm telling you, nothing beats Stacks. So if you're here, go to Stacks. Or if you like coffee, Infusion. But honestly, Infusion is just Starbucks, but on campus and a little more expensive. So honestly, if you want coffee, just drive a mile and you'll save yourself a couple bucks pretty easily. So, that's uh, a nice consumer tip for the day, I suppose. So, I guess, you know, I've talked a lot about politics lately just because it's, it's something that... It's something that it's hard to get bored of. There's a lot of topics to talk about in politics and in news. Unlike in local life, local drama, where there might be a few things, but there's usually not a ton. But in politics, there's always stuff to talk about. So, yesterday I was watching some debates from the Libertarian Party. Um, and an individual... Well, they all stick out to me, right? All of them are great. Dan Berman, Adam Kokesh, Vermin Supreme, Kim Ruff is amazing, Joe Jorgensen, um, and, you know, all the rest of the bunch. Max Abramson, um, and that other guy whose name I can't think of right now. Anyway, uh, it was a great, um, great debate. I've watched almost all of them now. And, um, but anyway, one person who's stood out to me a lot was Adam Kokesh. Now, right, differences aside, Adam Kokesh has been involved in some controversies, and I'm not going to take sides on that, but I'm pretty sure Larkin Rose has the high ground on that. But, nonetheless, Mr. Kokesh has some pretty good ideas. However, right, um... The idea of localizing government in specifically is an, is a fantastic idea. However, the way he plans to go about it is not possible. I'm sorry, Mr. Kokesh, but you cannot you cannot abolish the federal government through um through executive order. You just can't. That's not possible. You can't make one executive order and then expect the entire federal government to be swept away, right? You have checks and balances for that, and the President of the United States is not capable of making such, doing such a drastic thing. Now, if you got more libertarians in Congress, more libertarians in the Senate, then that would be possible. But we don't have 
any libertarians in any federal office right now. Only local and state offices. Um, I mean, there are some libertarian-ish Republicans, like Thomas Massey, and um, even I'd credit Rand Paul, but none of them are ever going to advocate for abolishing the federal government completely. So, I love the idea, I love the concept, but it's not something that is possible. Now, what is possible is a pragmatic wiping away of big government policies over time. So, rather than simply getting rid of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, we cut it off. We cut it off. Say, no one born before this time, no one born, yeah, no one born after this said year will receive Social Security benefits or Medicaid benefits or Medicare because we can't afford it. Um... It, Social Security was a Ponzi scheme from the very beginning. Why? Because this population, my generation, is smaller than the previous generations. And the... Right? So the United States population is actually dwindling. It's not going up. And so these... Uh, you have fewer people in the newer generation paying for more people in the older generation. And that's why it's unsustainable. One way we could sustain Social Security and Medicare is by taking in immigrants. But then we'd have to take in more immigrants the next generation. And then even more immigrants the next generation. So it's just, it's just not something that's plausible. So cut off Social Security and Medicare. Or privatize them. Localize them. There's a whole bunch of cool options. Uh, privatize or localize the welfare state. Abolish the federal war on drugs. Shrink the federal budget massively so the military is only big enough that we need it in emergencies in case another nation attacks us or threatens to attack us. We don't need to have sanctions in other countries. We don't need to be the police of the world. Bring the damn troops home. Cut the military budget in half. Hell, quarter the military budget. We just don't need such a huge over overbound military abolish the nsa abolish the tsa um abolish the department of education now i know some of you are going to say michael you're a college student you're such a hypocrite by advocating for the abolition of the federal department of education but here's the thing the department of education only funds less than five percent of all local and state uh, education programs. We can cut education by 5% on the federal level and then increase spending on the local level, increase community, increase charity, increase, right? We can make up that, that 5% in donations alone. We don't need the federal government to pay for education. Another thing about the Department of Education is it brings in tons and tons of new regulations that aren't necessary. So if we abolish the Department of Education, education at the state and local level would blossom. In fact, ever since the Department of Education was formed, the United States has been dropping in education quality. We used to have some of the top students in the world. We used to have some of the best education in the world. But now that it's been federalized. Now that Common Core is the federal standard and states and local uh, schools, unless they're private or church schools, aren't, allows, aren't allowed to use any other kind of curriculum, we've been dropping on the scale. Now we've been better, getting better at fine arts and sports and music, and I'm not going to say those are bad subjects because they're not. I love music. Uh, um, sports are great and, you know, art in general is awesome, but they're also not for nearly everyone and they should not be a focus of education in general. Because let's be honest, I'm not dissing here because I have a lot of great friends who are going into music and art, but you don't need a diploma or, and you don't need, um, you don't even need a degree to 
to be successful in visual art or in music performance. If you're going into music education, that's different. But into performance, you just have to be a good performer. And you can do that through private societies very easily. Um, so, well, I think the fine arts are great. I don't think that uh, necessarily that they should be the focus of education, if that makes sense. Another thing we can do to uh, shrink the federal government massively is abolish the Federal Reserve, abolish the IRS, uh, eliminate the income tax, and eliminate the corporate tax. So if we're going to have a federal government at all, we can have one simple consum consumption tax or value-added tax, right? It can be really small. There's no doubt in my mind that income tax is extortion, right? What happens, a lot of people, such as those earning between one hundred and four hundred thousand dollars and $400,000 a year are paying... Um, in fact, nearly all Americans pay an average of 50% of their income to the federal government. That, of course, isn't an income tax alone, but there are individuals paying up to 40% in income tax. And that doesn't seem like a bad thing to socialists, but paying 40% in income tax, you are literally giving up 40% of your time. So if you work five days a week, two of those days, full Fully, completely, 100% of those two days go to the federal government. Like, 10, 4 out of every 10 hours that you work are going to the federal government. That is slavery. That is literally slavery. So excessive compulsory taxation, especially that of the income tax, the property tax the corporate tax, and a bunch of other taxes based on what you earn are totally unjust and must be eliminated. However, we also need to maintain a balanced budget. So we need to cut the shit out of spending. Right now, the federal government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars on useless programs that we don't need. Um, they spent a, like upwards of a few billion dollars on a toilet, a self-cleaning toilet in the in the our nation's capital. It's fucking ridiculous the things they're spending these this money on. And um, Senator Rand Paul in particular, I love the way he just rants about every year he at the end of the year he puts together uh, a Festivus um, rant where he talks about all the wasteful spending programs, because that, that appears to be Rand focus. While I don't agree with him on everything, one thing I respect about Rand is more than almost anyone else in Congress, Rand is hell-bent on cutting spending. And that, spending cuts are so essential right now, that that is a man I respect. Another thing I respect about, about Senator Rand is... The fact that he's vocal about auditing the Federal Reserve, because it needs to be done. We don't know what's coming out of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve could be feeding money into the president's bank account for all we know. We need to audit it, make sure that make sure that um, it's not doing anything bad. You know, we uh, on in all honesty, we should abolish the Federal Reserve, but auditing it in Congress is a good start. Another thing is his vehement opposition to the Patriot Act. Because the Patriot Act is very clearly, very obviously unconstitutional, and it's sad that so many people, Democrats and Republicans alike, don't see that. They're, it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. You have a right to privacy, and the um, government agents don't have a right to search you without a warrant. They don't have a right to spy on you without a warrant. And right now they're doing it. And they're working with big tech to do it. It's ridiculous. Another thing I really respect about Rand is his emphasis on on um, congressional approval before we go to war, right? He He's strong in, strongly in favor of diplomacy over war, but he, like his father is very in favor of 
rather than allowing the president to engage in unconstitutional wars, which Trump has done, Obama has done, Bush has done, Bill Clinton has done, God knows how many other presidents have done by now, the military-industrial complex eats up like 70% of the federal budget, some shit like that. So I highly respect people like Rand who are going to call out presidents like this and who are going to favor bringing the troops home and only going to war through an official congressional declaration of war rather than allowing the president to shift the troops around wherever the fuck he wants. Now, unlike Rand, I'm not culturally conservative. I'm very pro LGBTQ rights. I believe in a secular government rather than a religious dominant one. I'm very much in favor of open immigration. Bring more migrants in. As many as we can. We have plenty of room. Despite what the Republicans are fear-mongering about, over, um, we actually are losing more, like more people are leaving this country than are coming in. So we can afford to take so many more people in. Um, and it benefits everyone. Like, we can bring people in from Haiti, and rather than earning two cents a day, they'll be earning, like, 100, 200 bucks an hour at the least. If they're skilled, they could be earning thousands of dollars. They could make a really good living for themselves and be way better off. We can take in people from Cuba and Venezuela who are escaping terrible regimes. These are smaller nations. These are ones we can afford to bring in migrants en masse from, and there's no problem with that. It's not an invasion. It's nothing like that. It's simply allowing people to move where they want free. I believe strongly in the free movement of individuals. And to the right, that's a radical concept. But to libertarians, it's just principle. But as, like, I brought up Kokesh at the beginning of the video, I think that localization is a great step to getting government out of our lives, right? Get as much as we can down to the local and state level. Um, and there's no problem. I have no problem with being pragmatic about it. You just can't do it through one simple executive order. That's not possible. Um... Another thing I respect Rand Paul about, and most other Republican senators for that matter, with the exception of Lindsey Graham, Dan Crenshaw, and shit faces like that, is the majority of Republicans in Congress stand strongly for the right to bear arms, unlike most Democrats. Now, Democrats see an AR-15 or an AK-47 and they think it's the scary thing 90% of the Democrats you ask who want to ban AR-15s or AK-47s have never ever actually shot an AK-47 or an AR-15. AR um, a small percentage of them might have once shot a shotgun or a basic rifle, but none of them have ever shot an AR-15 or an AK-47. They are not qualified to, to, um, to propose policies on concepts that they simply do not understand. They see the gun, and they're fucking scared, so they want to get rid of it. But in all actuality, there are lots of guns out there that happen to have wood stocks that are just as dangerous as AR-15s that they won't fucking touch. Why? Because they have a wood stock. That means they're not scary at all, right? Hunting rifles are just fine. I can't stress this enough. All gun laws are infringements on the United States Constitution. When the Founding Fathers wrote... And what's interesting is this is such a radical concept. Like, I went to my school's pizza and politics a few weeks ago and I told them, yes, I believe that all gun laws are infringements. I believe that the people should have the right to own all of the same arms that the government has. And 99% of them laughed at me, basically. They said, you're absurd. You're fucking absurd. But this is exactly what the founders of the United States of America had in mind. Most of them didn't even want a standing army to exist. They wanted the people to own all of the arms. But they mentioned specifically that in the event 
that a standing army must be formed to secure the safety of our citizens, the rights, the armament of the military, the standing army, shall not surpass those of the common man. These are the words of the founders in a nutshell. Specifically, I'm paraphrasing Alexander Hamilton, Federalist Papers, I believe it's number 28. So, according to the frameworks, the frameworkers of the United States Constitution, the people should have the right to own any and all of the very same arms that the government owns because it is the only way possible for them to prevent a tyrannical government from taking over. Question, how can you stop a tyrannical government when the tyrannical government has 10 times as many arms as you do? You simply can't. The more we allow the Democrats and even the Republicans to take our Second Amendment rights, the more powerful we allow the federal government to get. I apologize for yelling. That wasn't necessary. But seriously, right? The founders framed the Constitution in a way that guarantees the people the right to bear arms. uh, 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 And the Second Amendment is not a restriction on the people. It is a restriction on the government. The government does not have the right to take away the people's right to bear arms. But so many infringements on the Second Second Amendment have been allowed by Democrats and Republicans alike. Ronald Reagan signed a bill in 1986 that banned further manufacturing of fully automatic weapons to common citizens. And now these weapons cost tens, twenties, cost dozens, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And so much paperwork. This is unconstitutional. Another thing is Donald Trump supports red flag laws. Those are unconstitutional. He supports raising the age to purchase a rifle to 21. That's unconstitutional. He banned bump stocks. That was unconstitutional. In his book, The America We Deserve, he defended the so-called assault weapons ban, and he supported it, and he supported a mandatory waiting period for purchasing weapons. Donald Trump is not pro-Second Amendment. He is the least pro-Second Amendment president, Republican president we have ever had. He also supports banning 3D printed weapons. He supports banning homemade weapons. All of these things are infringements on the Second Amendment, and because uh, because the duopoly, the two-party system is so damn supported by the left and right-wing media, uh, the Republicans don't give a shit about these minor infringements because their only care is about the major infringements, about fucktard Robert Francis O'Rourke, who straight up says, hell yes, we're gonna take your AR-15s, we're gonna take your AR-47s, a a." AR-15s, AK-47s. I promise I know, I know ish about guns. (laughs) But he straight up says, yeah, we're going to go door to door, bang down your door, point guns at your heads to take your guns. Talk about hypocrisy. Talk about tyranny. And that's my two cents for this morning. Take it for what it's worth. Um, If you like this video, um, please like it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, Comment your thoughts down below. Share this video with everyone you know, especially those who like politics, fellow libertarians, Republicans, even Democrats. Share it. Um, Like, share, subscribe. Thank you. Bye.